I have been working with uh, city governments for about the last 15 years on topics related to climate and sustainability. And it really, it's just wherever the energy is. And right now, the energy is all around federal funding and tax credits. So this is what I'm spending a lot of my time on right now. All right, let's see here. I think that's good. Um, so in case you don't know who WRI is, we are a global environmental research organization. Um, and so we do a lot of environmental work, but always from the center of people and environment. Um, anytime we talk about taxes, we have to give you the uh, short disclaimer. I am not a tax lawyer. Ryan's not a tax lawyer. Most importantly, we are not your tax lawyers. So this is all to be considered for informational purposes. And so obviously we've spent a lot of time working with the IRS and with our partners on this, um, but we cannot give you tax advice. Okay, so what have we been doing in this space? Um, WRI has a partnership right now with uh, Lawyers for Good Government, the Government Finance Officers Association, the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network, and the Urban Sustainability Director network where we are working right now to figure out what the selective pay thing really means and how it's going to work for all of our our local government friends and so we are doing a lot of education we're working with friends at treasury and irs on things like getting the portal up and we're also helping um local governments actually file some of the taxes for the first time and so we have been in this in the thick of it with the tax forms um and we want to share some of those insights on what is this? How should you be thinking about it? Um, and how can we actually go through that process? Um, I just pre went through my previous slide here, but we're going to spend some time. Um, Brian and I are going to pass back and forth and we'll pause in the middle for questions, but we want to cover what is selective pay? How does it work? And what projects can it support? What are the key considerations specifically for local governments who are interested in elective pay? And then how do you start getting organized now so that you can successfully file? Um, so, you know, elective pay is this new pathway for funding projects. Um, previously, y'all probably know, you probably didn't file taxes. Uh, tax exempt entities cannot directly claim any climate or clean energy tax credits. This includes some of these really long standing tax credits, like the investment um, tax credit for uh, solar and wind projects, which have really contributed to the, the widespread growth of these technologies. Um, but they were only el el uh, available for those who pay taxes. So now in the IRA, elective pay created this new mechanism to actually receive the benefit of these taxes as direct cash refunds. So you can really think about this the same way you think about your own taxes. Every year you file your taxes, TurboTax walks you through it and it says, hey, are you eligible for this thing? You collect the boxes, if it works, a form gets filled out and then you get a cash check several months later. So this is really how it's going to work. Um, this applies for state, local, and tribal governments, government instrumentalities, so your ports, housing authorities, school districts, um, any other Section 501 tax exempt entities, so nonprofits in your communities, religious organizations, and also public power and rural co ops. Um, and this is really just a huge, huge opportunity and should be changing the way you think about government ownership of your infrastructure. So in the past, to really maximize some of these incentives, you would have had to think about third party ownership structures and more complex contracting mechanisms. You might still want to do some of those for a variety of reasons, but this is really going to change some of the economics and the options for ownership. And you should be starting to think now about what that could mean. So we'll unpack this a little bit more. Um, as we go through. But a lot of this I'm thinking through in that lens of local government ownership and scaling project development. So now I'm going to pass it over to Ryan to give us a little bit more of the 101. Thank you, Lacey. Um, I know this is, this is going to be a lot of detail. So we're trying to make taxes fun, which is definitely a challenging uh, concept. So bear with me as we talk through the details of exactly kind of what the taxes are available. Um, you can go next slide. Um, so uh, elective pay covers 12 expanded credits. Um, there's a lot here. So we're going to only focus on the ones that are most relevant to you. But we want to have this up here so you know that there are a lot of credits that are here. So if your city is focused on, you know, a very specific project or um, uh, outside of kind of the norm that most cities are doing, that could be eligible. But for most of you, the big ones are going to be uh, 48 and 48E, which is the ITC. 45 and 45Y, which is a PTC, that's investment tax credit and production tax credit, and then uh, 30C, which is 
the, the full name alternative fuel vehicle refueling property credit, um, which is essentially EV chargers, and then 45W, which is uh, qualified commercial clean vehicles, which is EVs and um, uh, both small and large. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, we can start to dive in. So the these are kind of the, the a little bit deeper dive into each one of these. So if, for 30C, you might see common projects such as EV infrastructure. Um, it's important to note that uh, these have to be placed in non-urban or low-income areas. Um, and then 45W, some of the example projects uh, are focused on EV fleet transitions. So if you're working to uh, shift to electric vehicles for municipal vehicles, um, either school buses, public transport, refuge vehicles, things like that, um, most of what we've seen so far is just EV fleet transitions with anything from you know trucks and regular cars, uh, just the, the build that the uh, city owns. For 45 um, uh, production tax credit, this is a little bit less common because it uh, it is largely on what you produce and that's how you get paid. Um, and it's on, but some of the examples we have seen are microgrids, community solar, um, and storage deployed at the distribution level or even port electrification um, for the many ports in Phoenix, no. And then the uh, the next one is rooftop solar. Um, and this, the investment tax credit really is the workhorse of the group. Um, so there's this is rooftop solar, wind on government buildings or affordable housing, and geothermal and HVAC, which is another important thing to note. Um, and within all of these uh, credits, the big role for governments is to really um, uh, educate and provide resources for nonprofits and communities. So you may be applying for these as well, but we have seen a lot of situations where, um, yay, go, we have airports, that's what we want. <laughs> And so what we have seen a lot of trickle down where if the city does it, then they can help local nonprofits and local community groups also understand how to do this. And it's really been our mission to help um, teach the teacher model in many ways. So we hope that this can kind of apply to you in a lot of different methods. Um, so we can go to the next slide. One common thing we've seen, and I can't tell you how many times we've had this come up, is people will say, oh, like energy efficiency, that seems like the most common thing. Unfortunately, elective pay does not apply to elective or to energy efficiency, but there is a way to make, um, while you can't apply for directive, uh, elective pay for um, energy efficiency, there is something called 179D efficiency upgrades. And essentially what this means is that you can't apply for it through elective pay, but you can, when you're in the contracting process, uh, negotiate savings as a path pass through mechanism when you're doing procurement or when you're doing contracting for energy efficiency services. So this is just something to be aware of that you can do, but to know that it is not, um, energy efficiency is not uh, eligible for elective pay. So before you, you plan on that, it's good to know. Next slide. Um, now, this is where it starts to get into the details. And if you if bear with me as we kind of dive into these, there are within elective pay applying for all of these different projects that you're eligible for. There are uh, four main bonus incentives to remember, and these are domestic content. Um, so whether it's made in the U.S. or not, prevailing wage and apprenticeship, uh, energy communities and low income communities bonus. Um, and I think, Lacey, if you can click next, there's some text. Let's see if this works. There we go. So the three, some common questions you want to ask about these, because these bonus adders apply to some credits and not to others. And but instead of going deep into each, how they apply to each one, which I don't think anyone here would remember, we just want to have you ask some common questions as you're applying. And these are, does this credit apply to my project? Um, so if you're building a solar project, you might say, okay, you know, domestic content, uh, if I'm building a solar project in, uh, you know, 2024, you can say, okay, domestic content plays a role. And then it's, does it add or subtract? So for example, as uh, time goes on, domestic content can be an adder, but it can also be a haircut. So starting in 2024, if it's not built in the US, then you'll start getting haircuts. Um, and then the other one is how do you comply? Uh, so for example, the low income community bonus requires a separate application process that is different from the elective pay filing process. I know it's a lot, but it's these these three questions that you can ask yourself really help um, understand and say, okay, how do I get the most from the credit I'm applying for and get you the maximum refund that you possibly can? Um, we'll go next slide. 
Uh, we'll start by going through the ITC PTC and the rest of the credits. Um, so this is the the really big thing to understand about the investment tax credit and the production tax credit is that these have been around um, uh, for a very, very long time, um, decades, and it, they've really been the workhorse of the build out of clean energy in the United States. Uh, it's important to know this because there is a lot of complex uh, kind of understanding bonus adders and understanding how it applies and math here. And just as, so you understand where that comes from, it's because these have been around for so long um, that they really have a lot baked into them. So starting with the investment tax credit, it's based on a percentage of eligible costs for a project. And because a lot of cities are um, building projects that are maybe not, not over a megawatt and not massive in scale, this tends to be the credit that uh, we see most common. Um, I'd even like a very, very high percentage of the projects that we're helping to file for elective pay. So think rooftops on, uh, rooftop solar in your library, um, uh, things like that. Uh, are usually uh, under the ITC. Um, this is claimed and received once a project is placed into service. And as of 2023, minus any bonus adders, uh, it's 30% of total eligible cost of a project if prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements are met. And just to note that there have been over the last few years, um, it, uh, an extended of eligibilities. So it's, it's also available for wind technologies as well. Uh, the production tax credit is uh, based on the amount of energy produced and sold by a system in a year. So this is if you're thinking about like when you're building a project, can I get the um, uh, can I get a the amount just by building it and I, the, uh, basically 30 percent of the cost to build it uh, comp or if I'm producing a lot of energy, then it might be better to do the PTC. And we have a whole guide essentially on determining making this decision between ITC and PTC because it is a um, the filer's decision. But we when we can share that out, but just to know most of them will be ITC uh, options. Um, this can be claimed, the PTC can be claimed every year for the first 10 years of a system's life. And as of 2023, it's equal to 2.75 cents per kilowatt hour and will be adjusted by inflation every year. Um, one other really big important thing to note is that beginning in 2025, uh, the clean electricity uh, PTC and ITC will replace the traditional PTC and ITC. Essentially, what this means is that starting in 2025, the credits will be uh, technology neutral and apply to any uh, generating facilities with a greenhouse gas emissions of zero. So what I don't think this will mean really a big change for the cities themselves. But if anything, it just means that more projects will be eligible for these tax credits, because it's less restrictive on what is eligible. Um, and we'll go to next slide. And john will uh, we'll go through that here soon. Um, and then this is just a little bit of a deeper dive into the base and bonus structures. So if you look here, you can see the ITC and PTC with this is the credit of saying, uh, I'm sure we've all heard the claim. Well, maybe not. But I've heard the claim a lot just talking to people where it's like, you can get 70% of your project paid for. And this is that breakdown of I've heard 6%, I've heard 30%, I've heard 50%. And if you want to understand that, this is where you can go to find that. So within the ITC, you get the base credit of 30% if you meet prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. But just to note that that, that requirement for prevailing wage and apprenticeship is only uh, uh, applies to projects over one megawatt. So even for a lot of those projects, it may not apply to you. So that 30% is really the, the powerhouse, the, the workhorse there. And then for domestic content bonus, you can get an additional 10%. And then for the energy community bonus, you can get additional 10%. And so this is where domestic content can be an adder and a subtractor if you don't meet it uh, as time goes on. And then the low income community bonus is that separate application process. We can get anywhere from 10 to 20% additional funds um, if you apply and meet the requirements for low income community bonus. Uh, this is just top line. We have, um, again, resources to go in depth for all of these bonuses. So that will come out at the end. But the big takeaway is that if you meet all of these and you successfully apply for these, you can get up to 70% of the project back. Uh, next slide. Uh, on to 45W, which is the clean vehicle credit. This applies to uh, many different types of vehicles, and you can get up to 7,500 for vehicles under 14,000 pounds and up to 40,000 for larger vehicles. Um, it is less restrictive on vehicle eligibility than the individual individual clean vehicle credit. I know there's been a lot of talk around the changes to individual uh, 
clean vehicle credit requirements, but just know that this is less restrictive. And the other big thing um, to know, and I think this gets to your question, John, is that there is a qualified manufacturer's uh, list, essentially, and we can have a resource where you can uh, plug in your cards and it will tell you yes, no. And that qualified uh, manufacturer's list, essentially, if your car is on there, then you are eligible to get the credit. So it's a pretty, pretty simple yes, no question. And then um, the filing process, you still have to go through that, and we'll get into that later. But for eligibility, it is it is pretty simple. Um, a next step. And then the next one is the alternative fuel infrastructure credit, also known as EV chargers, which we all love. Um, so it applies. Uh, the important thing here is that this to get this credit, it has to be built in either a non-urban or low-income census tract. So this means where the poverty rate is at least 20% or metropolitan and non-metropolitan area census tract where the median family income is less than 80%. It's a lot of a lot of language there. But diving into the details, you can use this map that we have linked here on the slide, and we'll send this after, to look up your jurisdiction, look up where the charger is built, plug in the address, and it the map will tell you whether it's eligible or not eligible. And so this is a really great tool where if you're wondering, can I apply for this credit? Um, you can just basically plug, in, plug it in and get an answer right from the map. Um, next slide. And I think this is where I'm gonna pass it back to Lacey. Yeah, thanks Ryan. So um, I think, we're going to move into more how do you think about this and how do you file, but I wanted to pause for a second to see if anyone had questions on the credits themselves. You can certainly unmute yourself at this point if you need to. All no? good. Okay. I can keep moving too. I just wanted to pause before we kind of shift gears in case anyone had specific questions. Um, all right, so moving to how you start thinking about these credits and, and how you might use them. Um, you know, really the scale of this is massive. They're untapped. You know, tax credits are different than grants. You don't have to apply for them. The only cap or limit is the amount of credits that you apply for and the amount of things that you build. So really the amount you can bring, you can gain from this is really just dependent on your own ambitions. And this should really be able to help scale municipal and community wide adoption. Um, when the writers of the IRA were putting together that legislation, they really were thinking that they wanted the grants to work with elective pay and to also work with the greenhouse gas reduction fund and the low cap cost capital that they were putting available there. They wanted folks like y'all to be able to put all those things together to cover as much of this cost as possible. And so that was really kind of the design was for all of these things to work together. Um, and so you really can't, you can stack elective pay with your grants and think about ways to use things like the greenhouse gas reduction fund, which will be bringing money to green banks and community development um, financial institutions. And those institutions can be developing or providing bridge funding that can help get you over the gap for these taxes. And so they were really designed to work together. Um, and so definitely want to encourage folks. I know that there's kind of a steep learning curve at the beginning, but these are here for the next 10 years. And so you can kind of learn it now. You can learn it in five years. You can learn it in eight years. But this you're probably going to be using this. So going ahead and thinking about how to figure out how these pieces come together will behoove you. And it really will change that leverage you have with energy procurement and allow you to think about owning assets, more assets, and thinking about how we can bring some of these projects to low income and historically uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, we mostly covered this, but just, you know, the, the projects have to be, have to qualify on their own for one of those credits. So there has to be that one-to-one -one ratio of project to credit. Ryan did a good job walking through this, but um, do wanna just continue to flag that most energy efficiency measures are not gonna fall under this. Most energy audits, and then some of the other supp supplemental things that might need to go along with this. So like re-roofing to facilitate rooftop solar installations, probably not gonna fall within um, elective pay. Um, and any qualifying infrastructure that you lease but do not own is probably not gonna fall within this. So I, th those are questions that come up all the time. And so I just wanna continue to reiterate what kind of qualifies and doesn't. Um, 
this really does provide a, a kind of unique source of unrestricted direct cash funds. And you should be thinking about what you do with those funds when you receive those funds. How do you want to use them or how do they need to be used depending on your, your local government? Um, they will be received as a lump sum cash payment directly into your bank account. So, you know, you'll need to be working with your financial offices, your budget offices, Glad to see some of y'all on the call here to figure out what are those internal controls that you will put in place on those funds to make sure that you know when they come in and where they go. Um, but because they are unrestricted funds, you really do have some options. You can just you know use those funds to pay back your project expenses. You can add them to the general fund. You could get a little bit more creative and buy down loan principal to achieve interest savings or fund maintenance or expand a project. Um, we've talked to quite a few governments that are starting to think about ways that they could take those funds and roll them into more of a revolving loan fund for sustainability projects to help seed future projects um, or act as leverage in grant or financing applications. So a lot of this is kind of TBD since we're just starting to have folks file for the first time this month. But these are some of the different ideas that people are thinking about when they're thinking about what to do with that money. And it, hopefully that ability helps you think, yeah, maybe I do want to actually figure out how to file for taxes. Um, we've said it once, we said it again, direct pay requires direct ownership. Um, leases, third-party ownership structures do not qualify. Um, I know that there are probably a lot of services and things that you contract for. Um, if you have, you know, if you contract for vehicles and those are owned by a third-party private ownership, you cannot file for those credits, and then um, you cannot file for taxes on those assets. What can happen is the private sector partner can file for the taxes and they will take that. You'll just want to make sure that in your negotiations, you know that they're doing that. And then maybe you can negotiate a lower rate. So you want to make sure that they're not just capitalizing off of you and keeping the product, um, the price high. So there is kind of a way that you can actually monetize that or get it well, not monetize it, but get that back, it's probably mostly going to be in a price reduction. So just a note that as you're thinking about that, you're going to want to think about that in the negotiation stage um, and make sure you ask, are you filing for tax credits for this? If so, bring that price down for me. Um, the stacking or blending piece I, makes it just a little bit more complicated, but it also can lead to significant cost savings. Um, one note is using a tax exempt municipal bond it does reduce the amount of credit by up to 15% um, because they are already tax exempt. So you do want to be when you are filing, you're going to need to say what funds were used for that project. And so you're going to want to keep an eye on municipal bonds. Um, but this just gives you kind of an example of how the capital stacks might change um, without elective or direct pay um, with. And then, you know, when I started talking about what if you had a green bank? What if you bring that capital in? How does that actually affect your capital stack? Um, I think this is my last slide here. So a couple of other aspects to keep in mind when you're thinking about how to use this. These don't work like grants. They're not competitive. They don't have ongoing reporting requirements. Um, basically, you file it once and then you're pretty done. So this, this does look a lot different than a competitive grant process. Um, so while this is daunting, just think about it. You don't have grant reporting periods for, for years into the future. Um, it's actually less paperwork. It is retroactive, so you can only claim direct pay once the project is placed in service. So once the cars are on the road or the solar, the solar installation is working, that is when you do it. So you're going to have to think about that upfront cost or that bridge financing. Um, the domestic content bonuses do become rules for clean energy projects in 2024. And then your tax year matters, but I'm going to let Ryan talk a little bit more about the tax year in the process. So back over to you, Ryan. Fantastic. Thank you, Lacey. Um, and again, this is the process of filing taxes as a city government, equally as exciting as project eligibility. So we are going to dive in. Next slide. Um, so the, the general process overall is that you want to pre-register your projects. And I'm sure many of you have heard this before, but it is this is a little bit of a, uh, if you think about that analogy of filing your own taxes versus filing for a city, this is a little bit different. So you will have to essentially write out all of what your projects are 
put them into the pre-filing portal, and then you'll get a unique identification number for each of those individual projects. And that's even for each individual uh, electric vehicle that you might be purchasing. Um, once you've pre-registered and you got your numbers back, um, then you will file your tax return. And this is where you're actually filing, you know, the 990T is the big form. And then there's, we like to say there's a cocktail of forms underneath that, that then you can file uh, in addition, depending on your projects. Um, and I'll go into the details later on the slide. And then you receive your refund. And this is where you get basically money that you can do whatever you want with, which is really exciting. Uh, next slide. So the, the process steps to go a little bit deeper is we is identifying your qualifying projects um, to start off with. So this is depending on your fiscal year, it might depend on on what what projects are in that list it might depend on what whether you're filing using a calendar year or a fiscal year. Um, but the biggest thing is essentially any project from the start of 2023 is eligible. So if you get a list of any project you've done from 2023 to now, you will be better than 90% of the cities that are starting to go through this process. And that is the big lift that a lot of people have to go through. And this includes proof of ownership as well with these, with these projects. So that's really the big first lift that you would need to do. And I'd say while you're doing that, building the internal team, like it, let's say you're emailing, if you're on the budget team and you're emailing uh, sustainability directors asking, you know, oh, when did this go in service? Do you have the documents that were part of this? Like that process of working with your financial officers and even working with in-house counsel, if they reviewed the, the legal agreement or they have, you know, a stake in this process, having that process of building those, those lists usually ends up working with finance and legal. And instead of just having one-off asks, we recommend, telling them and teaching them about this process because they're going to be required to kind of when you receive the money making sure it goes into the right buckets where sometimes requires you know city council approval mayoral approval and having legal and finance working together to kind of make sure this process goes smoothly and questions will come up that require legal and finances help um is really important so as you're it's kind of that one and two happening at the same time where you're building your project list and educating and building the internal team to make the project happen smoothly and effectively. Um, the biggest next thing, I'll get into this in the next slide, is the tax year and project eligibility as well. Um, I'll get into more details in the next slide. And then, then you can pre-register your projects as we went over, file your tax forms, um, and then you can get paid. Uh, and then we'll go into the timing of this because this is, uh, Lacey, you go to the next slide. Um, oh, well, we'll do pre-filing first, but I just wanna spend, um, uh, a little bit of time before, actually, can we do the next one first? Sorry, I'm going back and forth a little bit of time on this because this is the, the thing that trips people up the most is that when you're filing, you have two choices. You can file using your calendar year, which is January of 2023 to December of 2024, or you can file using your fiscal year. A lot of cities, uh, the most common one we've seen is July to June. Um, I mean, we've seen a lot of different fiscal years, but and sometimes your fiscal year is your calendar year. But just for this example, this July to June timeline is what we're going to kind of walk through, is that if you file using your calendar year, uh, you will have every project in 2023 that you've built is eligible. And because of the deadlines, the deadline for filing is four and a half months after, but every single city gets an extension from their initial filing deadline of six months because the IRS knows that this is a new process. It's a really tricky process where taxes are difficult. Uh, I struggle with them every year. So when you try to do it on a big city scale, it takes more time. And so there's, they essentially gave a six months extension automatically uh, for all cities that are filing. So what this means is that let's say you your fiscal year, let's, for this example, let's say I'm a city where my fiscal year is July to June. I put 10 EVs into service in March of 2023, and I put a solar project into service in August of 2023. I have, if I file using a calendar year, I can file for both the 10 EVs and the solar project. Um, all 2023 projects are covered, and my extended deadline is November 15th, 2024. The challenge with doing that, and it's all solvable challenges, is that you will, um, it's different from your fiscal year. And so we're we're currently working with finance and budget folks to make sure that we they have the necessary documentation to essentially have 
uh, a separate fiscal year and calendar year. And I know that sounds very scary and it sounds like a, a big lift, but I promise we have cities that are doing this that are, because they have a lot of projects placed into service between January and June of 2023. Um, and because of that, they're filing using a calendar year and getting the maximum refund they can. The other option, and we, and again, we, we're we not advising you, we can't like say one way or the other, but if you would like to get the maximum refund, we recommend filing a calendar year, but you can file a fiscal year. Um, ideally, that would mean that all of your projects were placed into service between July and December of 2023, um, or, or I guess past July of 2023. So this means that you would file for anything placed into service between July of 2023 to June of 2024, uh, in this example, those 10 EVs would be excluded and your initial filing date is November 15th and the six month extended deadline is May 15th. Now, I think this makes sense with this example, but as you get into your projects, it, the math gets very tricky with deadlines and projects and you're dealing with a lot. So hopefully this helps kind of explain this fiscal year, calendar year difference um, and understanding kind of what is eligible within that that realm of, of when the project was placed into service. Um, and then you can go back up to the pre-filing, Lacey. I hope this makes sense. It's not about the timing, because the timing will affect kind of the pre-filing. And before, um, so diving into the pre-filing, before filing your actual tax return, you have to uh, pre-register each property or facility you plan to uh, claim a tax credit through for. Um, it, each one will receive its own registration number. And I will say IRS put out a comprehensive user guide because to be very honest and just talk about the process of pre-registration, they don't really have it geared for cities quite yet. And so a lot of the language might be centered around um, corporate or business taxes. And so they have this guide that essentially talks you through if you're a city filing, it tells you exactly what buttons to click, what the screens look like, like where to put in certain information. And so it, it, I will say it is a little bit uh, tricky and not super, super straightforward, but we highly recommend um, if you haven't looked through it and you do plan on filing, just open it up, start poking through it and try and figure it out. We will also say that if you used ARPA funding in the past, or if you um, have an ID.me account, you'll need someone from the city to act as the kind of ID.me person to sign in. And then once you have that, sometimes it's a comptroller or the treasurer, then then the comptroller treasurer, if they you know have a lot going on and there's kind of a smaller team managing the elective pay process, you can assign certain users um, to be the kind of people filling in the information with the comptroller treasurer or ID.me owner um, filling it out, signing it at the end. Um, all right, I think that's enough on pre-filing. Then we can go to uh, the actual tax forms. So we won't get into, I hope you're still with me. I know it's a lot of detail. We won't get into too much detail here, but essentially all you need to know is that uh, if you think of it like a, 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 we have this fish graphic too, but if you think of it as a funnel where the 990T, every city needs to fill that out. And so when you're filling out, um, that's kind of your, the, all of the forms funnel into the 990T. And then the 3800 is like the sub form for the 990T. And then below the 990T and 3800, then you're going to have different forms for each credit that you're filing. So for the EV purchases, that's 8936. For the ITC, that's 3468. And for the EV charging infrastructure, that's 8911. You do not need to memorize these. There will be no quiz, I promise. Um, uh, next slide. And then this is just kind of what to do now. So we've gone through eligibility and a number of other different how to process to do it. So again, starting with that prospective projects, that's really the biggest lift to work on right now is looking at what projects you filed, looking at when they were placed into service. And once you have that list, then you can start to understand and say, all right, I've worked with the legal and finance department. We have this list and you can ask yourself, were any projects placed into service in early 2023? Do we have a different calendar year than our fiscal year? Um, uh, if we have a fiscal year that's not a calendar year, uh, how, what's the process? Um, uh, do we want to switch to a fiscal year? So once you start to get those, those lists put together, that's the big first step. 
then coordinating with your legal and finance departments um, and uh, and educating them that this process exists. Like a, it's such a new process that a lot of time it takes a call or two or a conversation or two with the whole team to for them to understand it. And the earlier you can do that, the more likely you will to have a streamlined process throughout. And then uh, the next step is integrating elective pay into your procurement processes. So this might be you know, and we were still trying to figure out the best language for this of um, building out uh, elective pay into RFP bids. And what does, you know, RFP language look like for future solar projects to meet all of the bonus adder requirements or analyzing whether elective pay is a better mechanism than third party ownership and kind of what are the advantages and disadvantages of that. Um, so hopefully that that gives a good breakdown. And then you can go to the next slide. And building your team, this is again, the most important thing. Uh, and it's kind of a reiteration of what we've talked about, but finding the finance officer who handled the process will streamline your service. Um, and so from ARPA funding, that's kind of been our big one, is if there's someone that worked with the ARPA funding process, they will have gone through this before or at least something similar. And they're gonna be the first person you wanna talk to. You wanna identify your in-house counsel and have a conversation with them and your finance officer and have a conversation with them. And then the other thing is for really large, complicated projects, um, you may need to bring in an accountant, a bond counsel, or an attorney specializing in tax and project finance, because these can get um, tricky, especially with as you get in, dive into domestic content and the specifics for large projects, there is uh, some tricky uh, accounting that might require outside counsel for that. Um, and just building up internal capacity is really important as well. And next slide, I think that might be it. Um, perfect. And then we have a lot of resources, but we want to have time for questions. So we will um, be sure you have those in the slides uh, when we send them out. I just wanted to quickly say we have annotated tax forms for every single one of the ones that, that can kind of walk you through. And we have worksheets that will help you gather and compile that information. So if you need like just an Excel template to be like, where do I drop all my EVs in in one place that can help you track eligibility, um, the project management tools.